Well, hello everybody and the Lord's richest blessings to you in the coming year. I don't have to tell you it's dark out there and it's getting darker. It seems that the days the Apostle Paul warned us about, days when people would be self-lovers and money lovers and pleasure lovers and no God lovers have come to pass. And the question is in a world like this, uh, what do we do? What we need is 2020 vision. Now it seems there are two alternative views in this department and I like to read two paragraphs, one from the heart of the Pentateuch and the other from the conclusion of the Gospels to show this striking contrast. The first is in Exodus 20 and verse 20 and we read from verse 18, Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. By contrast, in John chapter 20 and verse 20, we have another scene entirely. We read from verse 19, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The other evening, a dear Muslim friend of mine, riding in the car with me after we'd had supper at my daughter's home, asked me what I thought was a very important question. He said it seemed to him that uh, the mullahs uh, spent not so much time in the Quran as they did in the Hadith. The Quran is the book that gives the laws of Allah, and the Hadith explains how to live them. And he wondered if, in fact, the Old Testament was like the Quran in this way and the New Testament like the Hadith. Now, I was so happy to tell him that while the majority of the religious world thinks that the way to God is by keeping God's laws, the New Testament reveals a whole different way of living. And it's in this that we see our 2020 vision for the coming year. In Exodus 2020, we discover the giving of the Old Covenant. And in the giving of the Old Covenant, it was at Mount Sinai, we have what the scripture calls the administration of death or the ministry of condemnation. Because all the law could do was to show how far men had fallen from God's holy standard. The scripture says that what the law could not do, not because there was anything wrong with the law, but through the weakness of our flesh, it was incapable of bringing us near to God. And so the repeated refrain in Exodus 20 is, so the people stood afar off. By contrast, in John 20:20, 20, 20, we have the introduction of the new covenant. The risen Christ appears to his disciples. And he tells them that peace from heaven has come to them and the Father is sending them out on a mission. He wouldn't send them out without help. But as the Lord Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit. And there, instead of the people standing afar off, we read, 
that Jesus stood in the midst. And there he revealed to them not the principle of law, but the wonderful principle of grace. He showed them his hands and his side. And instead of the people being fearful, as we read twice over in Exodus 20, their fear was turned to gladness, from sadness to gladness at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. The old covenant said, do and thou shalt live. The new covenant says, believe and thou shalt live. And so the children of Israel saw the thunderings and lightning. They heard the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And they said, don't let God speak to us. Keep his distance from us because we're afraid. Instead, we see the Lord Jesus drawing near and showing them the marks of Calvary, and they delighted in the nearness of Christ. What a difference. And that's what we want to think about just for a few minutes. What did the wounds of Christ declare? As opposed to the law, which declared the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, and the judgment of God for those who broke the law, what did the wounds of Christ declare? Well, first of all, they declared that the last enemy was defeated. Christ had triumphed over death, and his resurrection was the receipt that God provided to guarantee that the price had been paid in full and accepted by God, and so everyone who trusts in him is set free. Secondly, the wounds of Christ declared that a full salvation had been provided. It was by the blood of Christ that the price was paid, redeemed not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And thirdly, it declared that God's supreme love had been demonstrated. There was nothing more the love of God could do than to give his only Son and for his son to give his life, that through that we might be given life eternal. When we think about the problem of sin, and we think about the Lord Jesus standing there before his disciples, we see this 2020 vision, if you will, in the substitution of the suffering Savior, he died for me, and the satisfaction that we find in the living Lord. He lives with me. The first message is the message that unbelievers need to hear. They need to hear about the substitutionary work of our suffering Savior. And the second message, believers need to hear the satisfaction that we find in our loving and living Lord. Now, the idea of salvation from sin is clearly seen in just a few verses that are found in the 103rd Psalm. You know it well. It begins with the beautiful words, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he names a number of them. Listen. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life, from destruction. These are the three stark facts of sin. Forgiving all your iniquities. This is the sentence of sin. We are guilty before God. Who heals all your diseases. This is the stain of sin. The repairing of the damage that sin has done to us. And then he redeems your life from destruction. This refers to the slavery of sin, the control that sin has over us, and God breaking the bondage of sin that so holds us. Likewise, in the same verses, we have the three facts of salvation. He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from destruction. In other words, he forgives, he provides pardon. 
For how many sins? For all your iniquities. He heals. He provides purity for all your diseases. And redeems. He provides power. Power to live a new kind of life here and now. Those wounds tell us something very important. We live in a society that wants to be pain-free. But these wounds tell us that while there's more pain than pleasure in life down here, the reason God allows it is because there's something better than pleasure. And that's progress. That's drawing near to God. These sufferings are the very things that bring us near to God. The sufferings of Christ brought us near to God in redemption. And our own sufferings should bring us near to God as we seek his aid, we seek his comfort, we seek his help, redeeming our life from destruction. But, of course, it's not only redemption that's seen in these wounds as the Lord Jesus draws near to us. It's also the objective of that redemptive work, that is, reconciliation and relationship. We are made near by the blood of Christ. We enter in through a new and living way, sprinkled by his own blood, into the holiest, past the veil, into the immediate presence of God. And, you know, as we read the, the New Testament carefully, we shouldn't miss this grand and glorious theme. Something new has happened. While God speaks of himself as a father to the nation of Israel, the concept of God being our personal father is not introduced until the Lord Jesus reveals it to the woman at the well. The father is seeking worshipers to worship him. As we read through the New Testament, it becomes obvious, doesn't it, that the grand theme is the love of God. The first and second great commandment are not to believe, nor yet to do things for God. They are to love him. And says Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, if I have everything else and don't have love, it's nothing. The Lord Jesus explained that if you hate your brother, it's premeditated murder. Sin is a fact before it's an act. And when a person thinks such thoughts, God records it by their name. On one occasion, the Lord Jesus said a shocking thing. If someone would dare to offend one of the little ones, it would be better if a millstone were hanged around his neck and he was thrown into the depths of the sea. In other words, Jesus was saying, it would be better not to live than not to love. And the whole message of the Bible comes to this, that the laws of the Old Testament have been superseded by the law of love. And so Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. You will keep my word. No one has to tell me to not hurt my wife or not starve my wife or not slit her tires or steal her purse. All of these things are caught up and far more in the principle of love. That if I love someone, I'll do more than ever the law could command me to do. This is the beauty of this relationship into which we've been brought. The Lord Jesus, in a sense, though he came to die at Calvary, he came to teach us how, as little children, to lisp the words, Abba, Father. It was the Father who sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, to bring many sons to glory, to stand someday with his arms around us and say, Father, I and the children whom you have given me. This is at the heart of God. And the Lord Jesus was never more than a few verses away from speaking about the Father. The Father himself loves you. Can, can you take that personally, brother, sister? The Father himself loves you. 
He likes to spend time with you. In fact, he wants to spend eternity with you. And he calls you near, as opposed to the children of Israel who were quaking and fearing and drawing back, stood afar off. The Lord reaches out with his nail-pierced hands and says, Come, come, let me introduce you to my Father. As he said to Mary uh, Magdalene after his resurrection, Don't detain me, Mary. I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. When Jesus tells the story of the prodigal, what does he say? In that moment of deep need, this comes from the lips of the prodigal. I will arise and go to my Father. This is the heart of God. This is the longing of God. Not only that we might be redeemed, but reconciled, being made near through the work of Christ. So there's nothing between my soul and the Lord. He is my Father. He brings us to the Father. And he says, I'm going home to my Father. And soon, I'm going to bring you home too. Do you want to be Christ-like in 2020? Do you want to have the 2020 vision? Do you want to be marked by gladness, even in the midst of sadness? Here's the key. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. To be Christ-like is not keeping laws. It's not stumbling over myself, trying to do the best I can. It's not thinking that the New Testament is simply principles by which I can live the Old Testament laws. It's something entirely new. It is the life of Christ within us. It is calling God our Father because we share his life now. The very life of God is resident within us. And we have this wonderful, endearing, intimate, personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship with God now. He's our Father. And as we think of this, we look at the life of the Lord Jesus and we ask, was that what composed his life? Did he get up in the morning and make a list of all the things he had to do? No, he got with his father and he heard his father's words and he did what pleased the father. He said, doing the will of God, doing the will of my father is just like having a delicious meal. It's my food and drink. It's what I love to do. And he said, as he went to the cross of all things, the worst moment of his life, uh, the moment of his abandonment, the moment of his rejection, the moment of his being despised, of being made sin and made a curse for us. What does he say? He says to his disciples that the world may know that I love the Father. Arise, let us go hence. Does the world know that we love the Father? Not by rule keeping, but by seeking that intimate relationship, making sure there's nothing between our hearts and his. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Oh, what a difference to see those blessed marks and to realize the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And why did he do that? To bring me near to his Father, to bring me into the family, to bring me into the sweet fellowship of the divine persons that through these beautiful words the Father is sending me into the world says Jesus as the Father has sent me I also send you the Son is with us and will never leave us and the Spirit has in come to indwell us to give us all the resources of heaven so that as we live in 2020 we will not be overwhelmed by the darkness around us, by the, the fog of failure, by the, the darkness of despair, by the mists of misunderstanding. We'll have the clarity that comes when we see the Lord, the light of the universe. We see him and we will be glad. God help us 
to live in the joy of this 2020 vision of seeing the Lord himself. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So now what? What's our strategy to get the vision for 2020? To see Christ in such a way that we reflect his glory into this dark world. The psalmist in Psalm 27, 8 says, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, will I seek. Now, there's a day coming when we'll see him. But at the present time, we have to seek him in order to see him, because there's so much to distract us. And I want to think about these four practical ways that can transform our lives because we're occupied with Christ. So first of all, I want to think with you a little bit about what Paul says to the Corinthians. And he describes for us how the Word of God is like a mirror. Now when you get up in the morning and look into the mirror, you, if you're anything like me, you don't like what you see. And so you decide you don't want to inflict that on anybody else. You're going to have to do some work. You comb your hair and wash your face and brush your teeth. And as you do that, hopefully, there's a corresponding change in the mirror. And of course, the reason for that is there are two sides to the mirror. There's the real world and the reflected world. And the reflected world imitates what's seen in the real world. But the Apostle Paul puts it the other way around, and he says, we beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed to be like what's in the mirror. And what he's telling us is which side of the mirror we're really on. That the real world is on the other side. It's in God's word, God's son, God's people, God's kingdom. That's where the real world is. And this world is a sham world. He spoke it into being one day. Poof, he's going to speak it out of being. And so, as we look into the Word of God, we realize that the Scripture is not simply informative, it's transformative. And you know how the two on the Emmaus Road, they were so discouraged. You get discouraged, I get discouraged. What was the secret? The Lord Jesus came alongside and began to show them himself in the Scriptures. The Scriptures are jam-packed with Christ, types and shadows and prophecies and messianic psalms and Christophanies and in the New Testament his words and his ministry, his, his miracles and of course the great doctrines of Christ in the epistles concluding with the unveiling, the revelation of Christ in the last book of our Bible. So we want to be focused on the Word of God but as we do that Thankfully, God has given us his Holy Spirit, the one who inspired the book in the first place, and the Lord Jesus said he loves to take of the things of Christ and show them to us. And as we do this, the glorious truth is that the Spirit of God begins to transform us, to change us from the inside out. And then secondly, and similarly to that, there is the revelation of Christ in his people. You know, it doesn't take any skill to criticize God's people, to find their faults. In fact, on one occasion, I was uh, speaking at a conference in the South, and a man had driven across three state lines to come and hear what he thought was my father. And he ended up with the second string, so he was a bit discouraged. And he came to me afterwards and he said, uh, what's your gift? Okay, I just preached for 45 minutes. He said, what's your gift? And I said, I don't know, brother, you tell me. And he said, well, I can tell you what my gift is. My gift is the ability to see through all the sham and all the facades and see the real issues with people, to see what their real problems are. I said, wow, brother, you've been honest with me. Let me be honest with you. You remember the story of the man who had one talent? You remember what he did with it? He said, yeah, he wrapped it in a napkin and buried it. I said, I'd suggest you do that with your gift too. <laughs> because quite frankly, we don't need any supernatural ability to see the flaws of God's people. But what we do need is to have the heart of God himself, the heart of God toward his people. 
and look for Christ in the people of God. And I tell you this, if we practice that, the way the apostle does when he introduces his epistles and sees God's people in the Lord Jesus, what a transforming thing that is uh, and how encouraging uh, to do this among the people of God. Number three, we have the, um, the miracles that Christ does in our lives every day. It's quite remarkable that the Lord Jesus said just before he went away, greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. Astounding, isn't it? Of course, it's not us doing the miracles. It's Christ doing them through his body. Just as he did them in his physical body, now he does them in his mystical body. We have the miracles of uh, direction, of wisdom, of answered prayer, of opportunities for service, of open doors for the gospel, of seeing people actually saved, brought from death into life. There are all sorts of things that can happen around us, and as the scripture says, that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. We sense the Lord is near us as we read in the book of Acts that the Lord was working with them. What a wonderful thing to see the Lord Jesus working with us in our daily experiences and doing what only he can do. And then finally, number four, we have the hope, the blessed hope, that 2020 could be the year. This could be the year, brothers and sisters. As John writes in 1 John 3, verse 2, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, face to face with Christ my Savior. And this blessed hope changes us As we think of the future, we think of where we're headed. It teaches us how to evaluate things. It teaches us how to look at people around us. It teaches us how to spend our time. He that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So may the Lord bless you in 2020, whether it's down here or up there. But may the Lord help us to rediscover the secret of focusing on Christ, of seeing him, and in seeing him, becoming like him a little bit more every day.